we live in a world that longs for um, revolution because I think we perceive that there is something wrong with the world. We long for, there is something in the human heart that is longing for utopia. And this desire for utopia or for paradise has certainly landed various nations in a lot of trouble uh, a lot of times. But the longing is something that is the mark of an individual who's been created in the image of God and knows implicitly by what we see and experience on this earth that there is something wrong, something deadly wrong with this world in which we find ourselves. But the longing, unfortunately, sadly, without Jesus Christ, is, is um, fulfilled not in a utopian world, but the folks that long for revolution quite often and regularly create some type of dystopian world, which is what we're seeing play out right now in front of us in our own nation. Now, Matthew has been about the inbreaking of the kingdom of God on the face of the earth. And that is that the Lord Jesus Christ, who was predestined from the beginning to break into the world and to launch, to inaugurate his kingdom, has done so in the book of Matthew. He was anointed king at his baptism, as I've said again and again. And this marks the beginning of the launching of God's plot to take over the world. That's what Matthew does. It is the beginning of of the launching. It's when the beachhead is made and God's plot begins to be revealed and the world begins to be taken back for Him. The Beatitudes tell us how that begins to happen. God changes the heart, the heart changes the person, the person changes the world, and the world fights back. The Beatitudes tell us how that begins to happen. God's people will take the world. And the Lord's Prayer is at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, the begin, or at the, in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, rather. The Lord's Prayer is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, and it is at the center of it, and is a prayer that is central to our understanding is prayer, of prayer, because this is how the Lord Jesus taught us to pray. And most specifically, as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, we are going to learn what it is to pray for the advancement of the kingdom of God on earth, the worldwide dominion of God, the global conquest of God, when God takes back what is His. It is a prayer that the church has prayed for millennium, and it is a prayer that is a threat to every ruling power. It is a threat. Albert Moeller says, this short prayer turns the world upside down. Principalities and powers hear their fall. Dictators are told their time is up. Might will indeed be made right, and truth and justice will prevail. The kingdoms of this world will pass, giving way to the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. This is a prayer that the principalities and rulers and dominions on this earth that do not acknowledge the supremacy of Christ, this is a prayer that they will collapse and that the kingdom of God will emerge. That's what it is. And thus, I begin my series on the Lord's Prayer, a prayer for the completion of God's worldwide takeover. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 I'll read through verse 13. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. and Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let me pray for the Lord's blessing upon this time together, and then I will begin preaching from this text. Father in heaven, we pray for your blessing, your favor upon us as we gather around the word of God, and oh, would it be that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done on earth 
as it is in heaven, and that through us it might advance, and that the wicked empires of this world will be taken down by the prayers and the efforts of your people, by the power of Jesus Christ, and that in their fall the kingdom of God would rise. We pray, Heavenly Father, for this time together that you would save the lost, that you would encourage and build up your church, and that you would strengthen us through the knowledge of who you are as we look at the introduction, or at least the first few words within this prayer. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So this is an example prayer. It's an exemplary prayer. It's not the only prayer we're supposed to pray. In fact, I think the way that it is said ritualistically in some quarters uh, was actually going against Jesus' intention. It's not what his intention was. He is simply saying, this is how you are to pray. This is something like you are to pray. He says in verse 9, pray then like this. Not pray exactly this, although there's nothing wrong, certainly, and I think it's beneficial to pray the Lord's Prayer if you mean it. But pray then like this, the like this. Pray then like this. And this is opposed to something. So we're to pray like this and not like something else. We're not to pray like we find the religious hypocrites pray in verse 5. He says in verse 5, you look, we looked at this last week. And when you pray, you must not pray like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners that they might be seen. And then he says in verse 7, not only are you not to pray like the hypocrites, you're not to pray like the Gentiles. He says, and when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. I think they will be heard for their many words. So when the Lord Jesus reaches verse 9, he's contrasting it with the false way of praying. The people who pray for show and the people who think they're going to be heard because they utter a whole bunch of words that they don't even understand. Opposed to the false religion, opposed to the gaudy religion, as opposed to the sanctimonious, wordy, ritualistic, and spectacular prayers of the world in a false religion you pray like this, this simple, short, easy to understand prayer. That's how you're to pray. And we focus today on the first four words of this prayer. And in those four words, our Father in heaven, in those four words, what I'm going to do is I am going to proclaim three declarations about prayer or three declarations about the God to whom we pray. Three declarations about prayer are three declarations about the God to whom we pray. So three declarations. And here's the first one. You ready? So if you like taking points, we got points here today. Declaration number one. We pray as a people. Okay, it's going to be three. Three declarations. Number one. We pray as a people. We pray as a people. Christian prayer, at least here, in this context, is a group event, something we do together. This prayer is not an individual prayer. It's not my Father who is in heaven. It's our Father who is in heaven. It's not for you as an individual, but it's for yous as a whole, okay? It's not for you as an individual, but it's for yous, for all of yous, okay? That's what it's for, and I like to put that S on the end of the plural you because it helps, you know? It helps you understand what I'm saying is what it does. So, this prayer is, for, is to our Father, not my Father, Okay? There is no my, I, or me. It's not in that prayer. You don't find that in the Lord's Prayer. In the Lord's Prayer, there is an R, an us, and a we. But there is no my, I, or me. It's an R, it's, a, it's an us, and it's a we. Okay? Not 
of my I or me. And there's a reason for that, by the way. There's a reason for that as we come to the Lord's Prayer and we find that there's an R and us and a we, but not an I, a my or a me. The reason is, is that Jesus Christ purchased a group of people on the cross. So on the cross, his blood atoned for a group of individuals, okay, for the church. Not one person, but for many people did our Lord Jesus die, did he shed his blood, was the wrath of God poured upon him. He suffered for the sins of a group of people. He suffered for the sins of our sins, the sins of us, the sins of we, not just my, I, or me. I'll give you some examples of this, how we know this from Scripture. Jesus suffered for the sins of a group of people, and he saved a group. Ephesians 5.25 says, Jesus Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It's a group. The church is a group. Okay? Jesus purchased a group of people. John 10.15 Jesus says, I lay down my life for who? For the sheep. It doesn't say the sheep and the goats. It says the sheep. All right? And then in Matthew, sets up the context for this actually in the first chapter. As we understand who the are or the us or the we are. Matthew 121, it says he will save his people from their sins. Okay? So there was a specific group of people in mind that Jesus Christ was purchasing as he suffered on the cross. And that specific group of people were the are, the us, and the we. And those are the words that are used in the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer does never use as my, I, or me. It's are, the us, and the we, always in the Lord's Prayer. So prayer is an event for all the people of God, and it is something that we do together. This is for a specific group of people to do together. Now, it's interesting, in Matthew 6, verse 6, the Lord Jesus tells us to pray in obscurity. He says, when you go into your room, shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. But yet here he indicates in verse 9 and throughout the rest of the Lord's Prayer that this is actually a corporate prayer, something we do together. We're a family, and as a family, we gather around the Father in prayer, okay? So if you have dinner as a family, there's a bunch of kids at the dinner table, and the Father takes the head of the table. That's kind of like the prayer of the church, is when we gather for prayer at a prayer meeting, or when someone leads us here in prayer on Sunday, or when you pray together as a small group or as a group of Christians, we are a group of children that are gathering around our Father to ask Him for things. That's what we're doing. And this is done in a group. It's a family. It's actually a family event when we pray. So if you don't take advantage of the opportunities to pray together as a church, you're actually missing out on something as a Christian. This family function of praying together. Praying together. And there's a likeness that we share with one another when we do this. You know? So if, you, if you're like me, you come from a family, there's a few kids in my home growing up, and there's a bunch of kids in my own home now. And you know, none of the kids are the same. It's amazing. They all come from the same mom and dad, but none of the kids are the same. They all have their own personalities, they all have their own differences. But I'll tell you what, they all share one thing in common. They all have the same father. That's the commonality that binds them together. Okay? And that's the commonality that binds us together. Is we all share the same father. And so with all of your differences, all of our differences, when we gather for prayer, we come to the same father. We gather around when the church gathers for prayer, it gathers around our one Father, and we are united under His fatherhood. And there's a word in this, I think, for, for the lonely, by the way, because we live in a very lonely world. 
This is a world that is quite lonely, and it's a very painful world for a lot of people who are dealing with loneliness. It's actually a world that, in my estimation, is, is very icy and cold towards lonely people. Loneliness is often, in our world, treated as, it's, as some type of illness to be treated. So, And I find that it's a very cold way of dealing with it. So when someone's lonely, what happens? Well, they get depressed, and their loneliness leads to depression, and then they go to the doctor, and the doctor talks to them about their loneliness and their depression, and they're given a few pills, and they're told to come back in a little while to see whether the pills work, okay? And that is how we will treat these types of things. It's medicated quite often within our environment, within our world. But Let's look at how the Bible deals with loneliness, okay? It's not a cold, take this and go do your thing. It's a warm, come here and let's pray to our God together. You see? There's something warm. And there's something uniting about the Our Father, whereby all of God's people are warmly invited into the presence of God our Father, regardless of the situations in which they find themselves in, instead of, look at, listen, instead of looking for someone to talk about the burden of loneliness with, this is an invitation to come to the Father is a group of people and cry out to him together is a group of people who are united and our eyes are upon him. It's a very special thing. When Christians gather together to meet with the Father. It's very special. It's very special. He is our Father. We're united together under Him. One Father do we share. There's only one Father, but there's many within the R. It's in all Christians. Do you understand what I mean when when I say that? He's our Father is in the Father of all Christians. So that when we gather together to pray, there's no distinction. Okay? There's no distinction between the clergy and the laity. Some would like to say there is. No. I have as much access to God as you. You have as much access to God as me. He's our Father together. He's not your Father through a minister. He's not your Father through an earthly priest. He's your Father through Jesus Christ. We all have access to the Father equally, indiscriminately. And you come to a church like this one, and there's many folks from different ethnic backgrounds. There are many folks here who know different languages, come from different parts of the world even. And guess what? We all have the same Father. We all pray to the same Father. And we are all deeply loved by the same Father because He's our Father. There's an R and us and a we in this, not a my, an I, and a me. Okay? Irrespective, by the way, this is, I think this is important. I love doctrine. I think it's very important to understanding God, and I think it's very important to knowing who he is and worshiping to him and praying to him properly. And even in saying that, our Father is for all Christians irregardless of doctrinal differences. Do you understand that? You know who God is through Jesus Christ? Do you understand his gospel? That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures and rose on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures? And you understand that and you believe that, you are part of the R. Okay? This would include Calvinists and Arminians praying together. You understand? People gathering together who very doctrinally, in their own understanding of things, and yes, I think these are very important things that we need to understand properly. But yet, we must acknowledge that each one of us has our own doctrinal shortcomings, and therefore, we are united around the truth of the gospel, and we each come to our Father, Calvinists and Arminians, our dispensationalists, and all millennial and post millennial and historic pre millennial eschatologies. 
all pray the Lord's Prayer. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. Do you understand? And it's quite a lot. You want to see someone's true theology? See how they pray because quite frankly, Christians typically sound the same in prayer. Regardless of what their doctrinal differences are. You ever notice that? Regardless of what their doctrinal differences are, they typically sound the same in prayer. And so this is a, this is a clarion call for the unity of the church founded within the gospel of Jesus Christ to our Father, who was in heaven. It's a prayer for all Christians, all of us. Enough with the parochialism and the clickishness that exists amongst and between churches. This is for all. This is for the rich in the church. This is for the poor in the church. This is for those who have social status and those who don't. This is for every single Christian to be included in the Our Father. This is for strong Christians. This is for weak Christians. This is for knowledgeable Christians. This is for ignorant Christians. This is for mature Christians. This is for baby Christians. This is for all Christians. The Lord's Prayer is for our Father. Our Father. This is for Christians who meet here. There might be five, six hundred people who will come to church here today. There's some church in the back 49 where there's a dozen. And they pray to our Father. Just like we pray to our Father. And then... There's a whole group of people who are meeting here today in this particular location, and there's a whole bunch of Christians that are meeting in other parts of the world who are praying to who? Our Father. As they hide in some basement in the Middle East, lest they be persecuted and someone break in and destroy them. Or as they run from terror in North Korea. Or as they meet in some hut in Africa. This is to our Father, all of us. So there's a level of unity within this prayer that is absolutely beautiful because we are united by one Father, our Father, our Father, our Father. So I said there'd be three declarations about prayer. The first is that we pray as a people. That's the first. That's the first. And the second is we pray to our Father. First tells us who we are. We are a people. The second tells us about the one to whom we pray. And we pray to our Father. That's very important. Because Christians don't pray to a force. You don't pray to the wind. You don't pray to some universal force that impersonably holds things together. And you sure don't pray to some distant deity who is cold and removed. You don't pray to trees. You don't pray to the animals. You don't pray to the birds. You don't pray to little statues or big statues or pictures. You don't pray to saints. You understand? You don't pray to Mary. You pray to our Father. That's who you pray to. He's not a buddy. He's not a chum. He's our Father. Our Father. The prayer is addressed to our Father. Now, some have falsely said that this word Father could also be translated into English as Daddy. Now, that's not true. Because in the first century, adults would refer to their earthly fathers by this term. Okay? So it's not a babyish type term to which you would call your father. There's a level of respect to this, and there's a level of maturity to this term. But it expresses the warmth, it does express the warmth and the relational nearness of a father. No doubt about that. It expresses the warmth and the relational nearness of one who is in a fatherly way in authority over us. 
That's what it does. It expresses the warmth and relational nearness of one who is in a fatherly way in authority over us. Okay? So if I'm in my office and my wife comes to visit me at the office and she's got a couple of kids with her, especially if it's the little kids, they don't hesitate to open my office door, run in the office and say, hey, daddy, and come sit on my knee. It's just the way it is. But they recognize, I've taught them to, they've recognized through work that my voice carries a very high level of authority. But yet, there's the warmth in that relationship. Do you understand? So there's the authority within the name, and there's a warmth within the relationship. And this isn't, he didn't tell us to say our mother, by the way. Do you understand? Jesus didn't say pray our mother because mothers are different than fathers. Mothers are different than fathers. I don't care what you say. Mothers are different than fathers. When the home is functioning properly, the mother is different than the fathers. And there's different characteristics that the father takes on than the mother. And there's different characteristics that the mother takes on than the father. They're not the same. And Jesus didn't teach us to pray our mother. That is a liberal innovation. That came to us through theological liberalism in an attempt to pervert the identity of God. Okay? And God has revealed himself to us as father, and therefore we address him as father, not mother. We don't have the option to pick how we address him. We address him how he has revealed himself to us, and he has revealed himself to us as father. And God revealing himself to us as Father is something that is not completely unique to the New Testament, by the way. Some of you have been taught that this is a New Testament innovation. That is not so. God revealed himself as Father in the Old Testament. I'll give you an example. Deuteronomy 32, verse 6. Is not he your Father who created you, who created you, who made you and established you? That's Deuteronomy 32, verse 6. You can also find references to God being Father in Malachi 1, verse 6. In Isaiah 63, verse 16. And Isaiah 64, verse 8. However, although this isn't unique completely or absolutely to the New Testament... It is unique to the time of Christ because it's not the norm by which God is addressed in the Old Testament, and it certainly was not how people addressed God in the time of Christ. Religion had corrupted, and there was no way the people were addressing God as Father at that point. He would seem as distant from them. And Christ comes, and he teaches his people to address God as the one who is near and the one who has relational warmth towards them, and that would be their father. And there's a reason that he's our father. There's a reason he is. And the reason he's our father is because he has adopted us into his family. So when you become a Christian, you become part of the family. You're adopted into the family of God. He's only the father of Christians because we have come into his family by the blood of Jesus Christ. We've been adopted. So, for example, Galatians 4, verse 4 says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who are under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Christ was sent to shed his blood so that we could be adopted and redeemed out of sin and redeemed into the family of God. Romans 8 verse 5 similarly says, You have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Okay, He is our Father because we have adopt, been adopted into His family by Jesus Christ. So do you know Jesus Christ? Have you been born again? I'm afraid for some of the children in this church that grow up in Christian homes and that think that because God is the father of their parents, he's automatically your father. 
You think that because mom and dad call him father, he's your father? I have more news for you. And it's not good news. Your children need to listen up. You may have very close relationships with your family. You may have, mar- you may have very close relationships with your mom and dad. And very close relationships even with people in the church. But if you're not born again, God's not your father. He's not your father. In fact, the scriptures tell us that the devil is your father. John 8, 44 says, you are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. If you have not been born again, you live for Satan and you are of Satan. And so especially you little kids and you teenagers, you think that because your mom and dad are Christians, it's okay with you. You're dead wrong. And so I'm urging you and I'm telling you and I'm commanding you to be born again into Jesus Christ and to be saved. Because you are in a very bad place right now. And you're headed for destruction and you're deceived and you're blind. And the only way for your eyes to be open is for you to receive the second birth of Jesus Christ. So be saved. Be born again. And come to the Father through Christ. He is only Father of the Christians. He's only Father of the Christians. Of those who have been born again. So you know, because He's our Father... When we pray together, the Father walks among us as he walked among Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. When we gather together as his people, he is there with us. He is there with us uniquely and specially, and his presence is felt, and it's like the father of a large family at a family reunion. And he walks around the children and the grandchildren. And he loves them each, specially and dearly. And the father at a family reunion, the patriarch of the family, has a special relationship with every single person in the family. For directly or indirectly, they have all come from him. Okay? He has sired them all. And so he is the one that unites them. And then his presence there is one that is very special and unique from the relationship that exists between siblings. They're tied together, and then his presence there, and his warmth is felt. And when we pray together, and we gather together as a church, the father is there walking among us as a father walks among his children. Walking among us as a father walks among his children. His children. You know? And that tells me something. That tells me that I can trust Him with my prayers. You who are fathers, who feel the weight of fathering your children, don't you feel that weight? Don't you feel the weight of making sure that your children are provided for and cared for? Don't you feel that weight? You want them to have food and a home and an education, a good church to go to? You feel that? I was raised in a home, thankfully, where my parents sought to take care of me as the best as they could, provide food for us, provide everything we needed for us because they felt the weight and they knew that that was their responsibility and no one could do it better than them. And that's the way I feel with my kids. I want them to be taken care of. And that's why so many of you, you fathers in this room work so hard, isn't it? You work long hours and you're tired at the end of the day and at the end of the week. Why? Because you want that family taken care of. And that's how your Father in heaven feels about you. But only it's perfected. And so you don't need to worry about tomorrow because your Father's already carrying that load for you. You simply take tomorrow to him in prayer. Your father is already cared for tomorrow more than you can care for tomorrow today. And this is the beauty of being a Christian because we understand that the father who loves us and the father that offered up his son for us is the father 
the Father who has planned tomorrow. So whatever comes tomorrow to me, whether it's painful or not, is something that is coming to me by the hands of a loving Father. And I can take it all to Him in prayer because He cares. There's more to it than that. The Father in heaven understands you when other people don't. He understands you when other people don't. We were at some friends, there's a couple in the church this week, and they have a little baby, a couple little babies, and the little baby boy is starting to talk. And he, he has some words that I don't understand. And he talked about bumpy, bumpy. I didn't know who, I don't know who bumpy, bumpy is, but his parents do. Bumpy, bumpy is Humpty Dumpty. His mother and father had to interpret that for us. You understand? Your father in heaven understands you and other people don't. When you pray to him, you don't need to be insecure about the words that you use. You don't need to worry about what the people around you think about you when you pray in public. You're taking your request to your father and you don't need to worry about how those requests sound when you take them to him in private. You may say it sounds like baby talk. Well, you are his child and he loves you and he is your father and he understands it. And some of the sweetest prayers are the prayers that can only be understood by the father because they're coming from a sincere heart of a child who's taking those sweet little prayers to his or her heavenly father, and only the father understands them. When you tuck yourself away and you pour out your heart to him and you groan before him, and he's the only one that gets it. Nobody gets it but him. You feel lonely. Your husband doesn't get it. Wife doesn't get it. Your kids don't get it. Your neighbors don't get it. Your pastor doesn't get it. Your church doesn't get it. Your father gets it. And you take those prayers to him. And he's the one that loves you. And he's the one that cares about you more than you care about yourself. He is your heavenly father. And upon him, we are dependent. And we take all things to him. Because he's our father in heaven. So I said that there would be three declarations about prayer. I've given you two so far. The first was that we pray as a people. The second is we pray to our Father, the one to whom we pray. And the third tells us a little bit about our Father. We pray to the one who is in heaven. We pray as a people. We pray to our Father. We pray to the one who is in heaven. The first thing told us about us, we are a people. The second declaration told us about the one to whom we pray. He is a father to us, our father. And the third tells us more about him. And he is in heaven. We pray to our father in heaven. You understand what it means when it says he's in heaven? He's not like us. Oh, he's near to us and... There is a relational warmth there, but he's not like us. He's above us. Do you know that in the story of Babel, the Tower of Babel, the people attempted to build a tower up into the heavens? And the Bible tells us that they built this tower so high they attempted to build into the heavens, and God came down to look at their tower. That's the wording in the Bible. Why? Why? Because he is exalted above everyone. You can't build a tower to him. Christ is the only way to him. He is above us. And this should should destroy, by the way, all chumminess, all disrespect, and all irreverence, which passes for so much of what we call Christianity today. The fact that he is our father in heaven ought to destroy the chumminess and irreverence that passes for so much of Christianity today. 
And I would suggest to you that we don't get how special it is to have a father until we get the fact that he is a father that's in heaven. And then you find out that the father in heaven has relational fatherly warmth towards you and with you. Wow, that's significant. He is not like us. He is not one of us. He is not created. He is wholly distinct from us. And the text tells us that he is in heaven. This is not a new concept, by the way. This is through and through biblical, both testaments. Psalm 97, verse 9. For you, O Lord, are most high above the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. He's in heaven. He's up. We look up to him, not down to him. Psalm 123, verse 1. To you I lift up my eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. Look up to him in the heavens, not down to him, up. This is biblical teaching of his separation from us and his exaltation over us and his rulership over the world. And we look up to him. He's not one of us. We don't look down to him. We look up to him. He looks down upon us. Now, I understand he's not only in heaven. He is everywhere. He's omnipresent. He's with us right now. And he's especially present as he walks and lives amongst his people. He is everywhere. Yet, the text tells us, this specific text tells us, that he is in heaven to exalt the fact that he is distinct above us and that he dwells in unapproachable light. He's altogether glorious. Completely separate from humanity, distinct and surrounded by angels who worship him day and night as he sits in his heavenly courts and he determines the affairs of the universe. He is above us and he is our Father who art in heaven and we look up to him because he's glorious. This kills all the chumminess and irreverence that we see in so many today. I recently heard of a pastor who led a group of people in a so-called prayer, and the entire prayer pretty well was a group of stupid jokes that weren't even funny, strung together. That was the prayer. Ha, ha, ha. Bow before God, and we tell a bunch of goofy jokes. Do you know how you kill that? You kill that by understanding that this is our Father in heaven. Prayer is not the time to tell jokes, friends. Well, there's a time for jokes, there's a time to laugh, and there's a time to mourn. But prayer is not the time for jokes. Because in prayer, you are standing before a holy God who is exalted above all, stands in unapproachable light, and is surrounded by all the angels and seraphim and are bowing down before him day and night. And yet he has decided to call us or call himself our father. It is a time of most appropriate gratitude and thankfulness and reverence. That is what prayer is to be. It's the refusal to understand this concept that our father is in heaven that leads to so much insolent, cheeky, rude, and insulting behavior in so many so-called churches among so many so-called Christians. And it's the refusal to understand this that leads so many into irreverent, disgraceful behavior. Because they don't understand that He is our Father in heaven. There must be a holy fear when we go to our Father because He is not just our Father. He is our exalted Father in heaven. Holy distinct from us. That's what he is. And the fact that the one who is exalted in heaven, dwelling in unapproachable light, surrounded by myriads upon myriads of angels, would condescend to the point where he would sacrifice his son upon the cross so that he can adopt us into his family and be called our father, tells us something about how loving this exalted being is. He's glorious and he's loving. I've said, I've proclaimed three declarations 
and I have. We pray as a people. We pray to our Father, and we pray to the one who is exalted in heaven. This kills all bad ideas about God. This makes hash of all your idols. This burns to the ground any nonsensical, idiotic idea you have heard about God because this tells us, the opening four words of the Lord's Prayer tell us who God is. It tells us that we are, uni we are united in Him. It tells us that He is our Father. And it tells us that He is exalted in heaven. And this is all held together by the very fact that he has purchased us for himself by the blood of the cross. And we can cast ourselves upon this gracious and supreme being who has warmth and relational affection to us, towards us, is our Father. And we can cast ourselves, and we do, upon his loving, all-powerful arms.